Hello, everyone. It's so good to be back with you. We hope you're really enjoying these classes and courses. We're having a lot of fun doing this, and we hope that you're having fun as well as learning something. And our idea is that by the end, you're going to be much better gardeners or at least have a lot more fun in your garden uh, once you gone through these classes. And today we're going to talk about, it's module seven, and it's on plant nutrition. We're going to talk about a little bit about fertilizers, uh, about the soil, you know, always comes back to the soil. That's a big important part of any garden and gardening. So we're going to keep referring to that and things that go on in the soil. And you're going to see that if you get the soil right from the very beginning, that solves a lot of your problems. And we're also going to talk a little bit about organic fertilizers and organics and, and what all that has to do with it. So the first thing we do, you know, we told you that there are certain essential plant nutrients and there's a number of them uh, that are considered essential. And what makes a, a nutrient an essential plant nutrient? Well, if the plant cannot complete its entire life cycle without the element, then it's an essential plant nutrient. Uh, if no other element can perform that same function that this element does in the plant, and if the element is directly involved in the plant's nutrition, if all three of those uh, characteristics are satisfied, then it's considered an essential plant nutrient. Now, there's a, a list of those, and as you can see on this table here, we list all of the different plant nutrients. Uh, we also list the form that the plant can take them up in. Now, just because iron's in the soil or phosphorus is in the soil or potassium is in the soil, it doesn't mean it's available for your plant to take it up. They have to exist in a certain ionic form before the plant can actually, the plant roots can absorb it and take it up and make it usable by the plant. And so on this table, we list the form that the chemical exists in for the plant to take it up. Uh, we list the source of that to the plant. Uh, where does it come from? And so uh, this table, is. Uh, we also set it up so that uh, any of the nutrients that are typed in in all caps, those are the primary macronutrients. And then if the first letter is capitalized in the element, then that is a secondary macronutrient. And then if uh, the letters are all lowercase, those are micronutrients. Now macronutrient, micronutrient, secondary macronutrient, all that is to say that if it's a, mic a macronutrient, that is an element that is used in large amounts by the plant. And so it needs a lot of it to grow and to be healthy and to complete its life cycle. The secondary macronutrients, those are also used in large amounts, uh, sometimes not quite as much as the macronutrients, and frequently the nutrients will be simply divided as macronutrients or micronutrients. Sometimes the micronutrients are called trace elements, and they're called micronutrients because they're used in such small amounts. It's not that they're less important than the macronutrients, but it just means that for the plant to be healthy, it doesn't need quite as many of those. And plant deficiencies, the nutrient deficiencies, usually occur with the macronutrients and not the micronutrients because if they're used in such small amounts, uh, it's always, they're almost always in the soil. Not, you can't say really that they're always in the soil, but there's a good chance with most of the micronutrients, they're gonna be there and you don't have to add those. And it's the macronutrients that you'll have to add, but they're just as important and they're just as needed and plants can suffer from lack of having those nutrients available. Now, the principal con plant constituents, if you take the dry weight of a plant and then you analyze the chemical makeup of it, what you'll find is that it's 45% carbon, 45% hydrogen, and 6% oxygen. Now those are the three macronutrients that aren't in the soil. Those are all coming from the water or from the air. And if you look at it, that makes up 96% of a plant's dry weight. Now I'm not talking about the wet weight, so it's not including water. This is the dry weight. So a plant, dry weight is 96% carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And then we move into the primary and the secondary macronutrients. You have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Now if you look at the percentage of those by dry weight, 
that adds up to, I think, 3.5%. So between the elements from the soil and water, the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and then these uh, six macronutrients, that is 99.5% of the entire plant is made up of just these nine elements. Well, we're talking about 17 or 18 uh, total elements that are needed. So now here are the micronutrients. All the way, chlorine, iron, manganese, boron, zinc, copper, molybdenum, and then those final set of micronutrients there. Uh, the nickel, cobalt, sodium, silicon, vanadium, there's even a few more. And what these are, and the reason they're in italics, is these are micronutrients that maybe not every plant needs, but there are some plants that these are essential nutrients to. So uh, these are considered, uh, sometimes they are considered as essential plant nutrients, but not every plant needs these, uh, the five that I have listed here. But the other ones, all plants need chlorine, iron, manganese, boron, zinc, copper, and molybdenum. And if you add all that up, those percentages by dry weight, and you can see some of them are almost immeasurable. If you think of molybdenum, 0.00001% of the plant's total weight is molybdenum. But without molybdenum, the plant can't be healthy. So it is an essential nutrient, but those last seven or eight micronutrients, they make up less than one half of 1% of the total dry weight of a plant. So I hope you're getting some idea now of the fact that there are a lot of, there are several nutrients that we've identified as being essential for a plant, um, but they aren't all needed in equal amounts. And so that is where the soil and your fertilizers and everything come in is providing just the right amounts for your plant so that it has all of the nutrients, all the nutrients that it needs so it can be healthy. Because if you have that many essential nutrients, say we have 17 essential nutrients, well, the limiting factor to a plant's health and its growth can be just one of those nutrients. Because the one that is in the lowest concentration and lowest availability to the plant is going to be the one that limits the plant's health. Even though all the others are there in ample supply, if one is lacking, the plant won't be healthy it becomes the limiting factor to your plant's health and growth. Now, from a plant's eye view, the nutrients that it takes in, it doesn't care where it comes from. That table we showed you earlier, it showed you the ionic forms that the plant can take those nutrients up in. Now, this has been shown through numerous experiments and numerous experimentation that if a plant wants to take up a particular nutrient, there's only one form that the roots can absorb it and the plant can take it up. And these are almost always some form of ion, either a cation or an anion. The only one that can actually be taken up not in an ionic form is boron. And it can be taken up as boric acid, but it can also be taken up in an ionic form. But every one else of all of them have to be in an ionic form. And the plant, as far as it's concerned, it doesn't care if it gets its nitrogen from ammonium nitrate, if it gets it from blood meal, or if it gets it from cow manure. Because until that fertilizer that you've given it or that material that is supplying the nitrogen to that plant is converted into the form that the plant can take up, in this case, talking about nitrogen, it would either be into nitrates or ammoniums, then until that nutrient is converted into that ionic form, the plant can't take it up. So as far as the plant's concerned, it, there's no difference where the nutrient comes from to the plant because it's only going to take it up in one form. And organic material has to be conferred, converted into that proper ionic form by microorganisms in the soil before the plant can take it up. So no matter what the fertilizer is, chemical or organic, the plant only takes up its nutrients in one form. And as you remember this chart from earlier when we were talking about soils, the soil pH is really important in determining how those chemicals exist in ionic form in the soil. So the plants can only take them up in certain forms, 
These are ionic forms. And these ionic forms with the different nutrients can only exist at a certain pH. And so the pH in the soil is a primary determinant of what the plant nutrients are available to the plant. So keep that in mind. Going back to soil testing again now, the soil test will tell you the different nutrients that are in your soil, but it'll also tell you the pH. And that pH is very important. You want to keep it right in the plant loving zone. Anywhere from five and a half to six and a half is usually where most plants like to have their pH and when most nutrients will be available. So soil pH, very important when it comes to a soil nutrients and their availability to the plant. So now let's move on and start to talk about fertilizers. Whether it's a chemical fertilizer or an organic fertilizer, anything that is sold and marketed in the U.S. as a fertilizer has to have analysis done. If it's sold and marketed as a fertilizer, it's going to come with analysis. And that analysis, uh, the one, first thing you'll notice are three large numbers on the package. This is required of all fertilizers. It is a convention across the U.S. that all fertilizers have to have those three numbers. And those three numbers tell you three different things about the fertilizer that you're using. The first number is the percent amount of nitrogen in this fertilizer. So on the example we have here, the bag is labeled 10, 10, 10. So that means that in this bag, 50 pound bag of fertilizer, 10% of that weight is attributed to nitrogen that's in the bag and the fertilizer and that nutrient that could be available to your plant. The second number is the amount of phosphate in the fertilizer, the percent phosphate. So in this bag, once again, this one has them all the same, 10% of the weight of this fertilizer is phosphate. Now you'll notice the first number, it tells you the percent amount of nitrogen, just the element nitrogen. The last two numbers, they aren't strict percentages of an element. So all the fertilizer bags are labeled with the percent, the number, second number is the percent of phosphate, the P2O5. That's how it's analyzed, that's how it's presented. That's the form the plant takes it up in. Nitrogen, it takes it up uh, uh, as nitrates or ammonia, but the convention is due to the analysis that's done that the first number is the, is the percent nitrogen, the second number is percent phosphate, and the third number is the percent amount of potash in the fertilizer. And potash, that's the potassium source for the plants. That's K2O. Now, you'll frequently be you heard and stated that those numbers represent the percent nitrogen, the percent phosphorus, and the percent potassium in the fertilizer. Now that's a good convention, that's not really totally wrong because uh, they're telling you in those percentages, but strictly speaking, it's the percent nitrogen, the percent phosphate, and the percent potash that's in that fertilizer. And so those three numbers are important because with fertilizer recommendations, they will always be made in the amounts to use based on those NPK numbers. And so that's common terminology as well. It's considered NPK. And nitrogen always comes first, phosphorus always comes second, and potassium always comes third. And every fertilizer bag will have all three slots filled with a number on that bag. So even if it's 0% something, it will be up there. So if this were 10% nitrogen and didn't have the other two elements in it at all, it would be 10 0, 0 All three numbers will always be on the bag even if the number is zero. Now a little bit about uh, some fertilizer terminology um, and a little bit more about the labels. Now you often hear people making recommendations that okay, just go ahead and use a balanced fertilizer for your garden. And when we're talking about balanced fertilizer, that's a term that's used to apply to a fertilizer that more or less has equal amounts of the three main nutrients, the three biggies, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. 
So something like 10, 10, 10, 8, 8, 8, 13, 13, 13, all three numbers are the same. That's one that's often called a balanced fertilizer. And when textbooks uh, or publications or even your own <laughs> extension agent gives you a recommendation for how much to use, say you need so many pounds of nitrogen, so many pounds of phosphorus, so many pounds of potassium in your garden, those will always be given in, in nitrogen, P being phosphate, and K being potash. So if it says you need five pounds per 100 square feet of phosphorus, what they're really saying is you need five pounds per 100 square feet of phosphate. So that's why those numbers are nice. Uh, you can always use those to calculate how much fertilizer you're going to need. Now you'll also find on the fertilizer label, it's usually smaller somewhere else, you'll find more detail about what's in the fertilizer and more analysis. And this is a guaranteed analysis label that you'll find on your fertilizer bag. And as I said, you got the big three numbers, the NPK, but there also may be other nutrients that are available to your plant in a fertilizer. And that you will find on the guaranteed analysis label. Uh, the example that we have here, you can see it gives the nitrogen, it even breaks the nitrogen down into the different forms that are in the fertilizer and available. Uh, the ammoniacal nitrogen, the nitrate nitrogen, and the urea nitrogen. But they all add up to 12%. This is a 12-4-8 fertilizer. It tells you the amount of phosphate, 4%, the amount of potash that's available, 8%. But now you can see this also contains some other essential plant nutrients in it. It contains calcium, magnesium, sulfur, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc. These are all essential plant nutrients. So this fertilizer goes beyond just supplying the NPK that your plant needs. It also supplies some of these other essential elements. Now this you will find on the guaranteed analysis part of the label of your fertilizer. So it's really important once you see the big NPK numbers to go ahead and flip the bag over. It's almost always on the back side of the bag or the box. And look for that smaller guaranteed analysis label. That will tell you a lot of important things about your fertilizer that you're getting ready to use. For example, if you had a fertilizer that was a 1248 and right next to it another brand that was 1248, one of them may only have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in it. And the other one may also include these other essential elements. And when you look at the guaranteed analysis, then that may help you decide, well, you know, I might need to add a little of these extra elements to my plant soil. And so you go ahead and get the one with the extras in it. And that also can be a difference sometimes in what makes one fertilizer cost more than another is one, the big numbers may be the same, but one of them may provide even more. And also on this guaranteed analysis label, they will tell you what was the source of these elements in your fertilizer. Now in this one you can see um, the, tell you that the different nutrients are derived from, and then they tell you where the nitrogen comes from, in this case ammonium nitrate, urea, and ammonium phosphate, then where the pota potassium comes from, uh, and the nitrogen comes from ammonium phosphate, and the phosphorus also comes from that ammonium phosphate. So that one's providing two of the nutrients for you. But you can see there's a whole list of things there, and it tells you where these other essential elements come from. So it's fun to check it out on the label and to see where all this comes from, and it'll give you a lot of good information. Some other fertilizer terminology you'll hear is uh, organic fertilizers and then synthetic fertilizers, sometimes called chemical fertilizers. And the main difference between organic fertilizers and chemical fertilizers is the organic fertilizers, that is uh, nutrients that are coming from a plant, animal, or even mineral remains that are uh, they're packaged and sold in either the raw state or in pelleted form, and there's very little processing goes on. So you're essentially getting the raw organic matter or even uh, naturally occurring minerals in that fertilizer and there's no processing, no simplifying them chemically. 
You're just getting them as they are, and that's an organic fertilizer. Now, the chemical fertilizers, they are chemically processed compounds. And even though some of them may come from naturally occurring mineral deposits, those deposits are further uh, processed and, and chemically processed to give you purer forms of the particular nutrient that they're talking about. And so that's the chemical uh, or synthetic fertilizer. So that's the main difference between them is um, how much processing they go through and uh, the form that you're getting them in. In the raw material, the organic matter, the organic fertilizers, you're getting a lot more than just that particular nutrient. Whereas in the chemical fertilizers, that particular nutrient is really about all you're getting. Now, plants can suffer from nutrient deficiencies. And we're going to go through that a little bit. And the reason we're going to go through that is because later on we're going to be talking to you about diseases that your plant can uh, develop. Those are um, from bacteria or fungi or nematodes or uh, insects or any of that sort of thing. And what you may see, the commonality amongst all those diseases I just mentioned is that they involve a living organism causing the problem with your plant. And so those are called biotic disorders or uh, in the commonly accepted terminology now, those are biotic diseases. Then there is the abiotic disorder. These used to be also called abiotic diseases, but we've moved away from terming them as diseases, and they're simply called abiotic disorders. And that's some abnormality in the plant that is not caused by a living organism or a living pest. And there are several things that could be classified as abiotic plant disorders. Nutrient deficiency, which I mentioned, is one. A pesticide injury, which you'll learn about in the pesticide usage and safety in Module 8. Pesticide injury would be an abiotic disorder. Weather-related problems. Hail damage, abiotic disorder. Lightning strikes, abiotic disorder. Several things like this that are caused by the weather, these would be abiotic and abiotic disorder. Mechanical injury is also an abiotic disorder. If you're using the weed whacker around your newly planted uh, citrus tree and peel the bark around the bottom and then suddenly uh, you're calling your local extension agent saying, you know, why is my little orange tree dying? It just suddenly wilted overnight and it's dying. Well, you can go out and do an examination and realize, oh, it's been injured by a weed whacker and it's, the roots can no longer supply waters and nutrients to the upper part of the plant, so it's gonna die. This will be a mechanical injury and an abiotic disorder and not a disease. Flooding and drought. Those are all problems that your plant's gonna suffer some effects from abiotic disorder. If you're using a fertilizer and suddenly apply too much accidentally or spill the bag in the, in the garden and then a, within a day or two you notice your plant's starting to look wilted and, and dying all around, this could be caused by fertilizer burn. So there's too much fertilizer in the soil, uh, the pH gets really screwy, fertilizer burn, again, an abiotic disorder, and genetic abnormalities in a plant. Um, plants grow, they reproduce, they can have mutations happening in their genes. If that happens and it shows up on your plant as a genetic abnormality, this too is considered an abiotic disorder. Even though the plant's alive and the things that are going on, the actual disorder is not caused by a living organism, but something within the plant itself. And so uh, genetic abnormality is considered an abiotic disorder. Now, since we're talking about plant nutrition, fertilizers, and all that in this module, I'm going to go through a, a quick set of slides here. And you'll have these available, remember, to go back and check uh, if you want to see more about them. Uh, but I'm going to go through a quick set of slides that shows you the different nutrients and the nutrient deficiencies that you can see in a plant. Now, the examples I'm going to show you all happen to be with tomatoes and tomato leaves. And these nutrition deficiencies 
don't just show up in the leaves. They can show up in other parts of the plant as well. Uh, but usually you'll see it first in the leaves uh, because that's where all the food processing, you know, where the photosynthesis is happening, where the food's being made, that then it ships out to the flowers and the roots and the fruits and everything as it's developing. So usually a nutrient deficiency will show up first in the leaves, but that's not always the case, and it isn't restricted to the leaves. So keep that in mind. Even though I'm going through this and showing you primarily leaves, it can show up somewhere else. And so let's go through the biggies first. Nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen is important in a plant for protein and synthesis, amino acids, for producing chlorophyll and cell formation. But if your plant doesn't have enough nitrogen, it usually shows up first in the older leaves, and that's because uh, nitrogen is one of those mobile type nutrients. So if a plant is running short on nitrogen, it will take nitrogen out of the older leaves and move it up into the younger leaves. So mobile and immobile nutrients, that's a part of a plant and its nutrition. Usually if the symptom shows up in the older leaves first, that is a mobile nutrient. If it's showing up in the younger leaves first, it's usually considered an immobile nutrient. So with nitrogen, if your plants have light green leaves or yellowish leaves, uh, but there's no chlorosis showing up, they just have this overall pale look to them, then it could be a nitrogen deficiency. Phosphorus, that's also important in protein synthesis, in cell formation, in fat and carbate, hydrate metabolism, and if phosphorus doesn't show up, that can be, if you don't have that in a plant, the plants can be even a darker green than normal, and they may even, as this picture shows here on the right, you can see that they have a purplish or red color to them. And once again, the older leaves will show this first. Potassium, important in water regulation and enzyme activity. Usually the effects are localized. Um, and you'll see chlorotic areas, and, and you can even, as you see here on the right, you can look like the edges of the leaf are burned, the margins are burned by something. And so you have chlorosis and marginal leaf burning, that could be potassium deficiency. Sulfur deficiency, sulfur is important in protein and amino acids, vitamins and oil synthesis and formation. And with sulfur, you'll have chlorosis, but you won't have intervenal chlorosis. You'll have the young leaves looking light green, and there's usually no uh, chlorotic spotting or striping going on. Uh, calcium deficiency. Now, this is one that if you've ever grown tomatoes, you've probably heard of and seen before. Now, calcium is important in root permeability and enzyme activity. And if your plant is deficient in calcium, one of the things that can happen is the terminal bud or the apical bud will die without calcium. And the young leaves of the terminal bud, they'll start to, you know, to get crooked and gnarled and then eventually they'll turn brown and they'll die. But in tomatoes, there's a common disease called blossom end rot, which is really not a uh, rot at all. It's not caused by any biotic organism it is caused by a lack of calcium availability to the tomato. And so the ends of the tomatoes will start to get black and brown and sunken. And you may think you have a disease, but what you have is an abiotic disorder, uh, calcium deficiency. Magnesium, that's another one of the, uh, the big six. Um, it's important in chlorophyll, fat formation, metabolism. And with magnesium, you'll have chlorosis, uh, intervenal chlorosis, and the leaves on this will sometimes turn red and even develop dead spots. And what you're going to see with a lot of these nutrient deficiencies are chlorosis seems to be one of the commonalities with them. And it's the way the chlorosis shows up. If it shows up, where it shows up on older leaves or younger leaves, is it intervenal? Is it total? Uh, intervenal, by that I mean that the area between the veins of the leaf gets chlorotic or turns yellow, but the veins themselves stay green. So that would be intervenal chlorosis. And what you're going to see with these nutrient deficiencies, a lot of times chlorosis is one of the symptoms. So you have to go beyond that and see how that chlorosis is showing up to see if what you're really 
um, which nutrient you may be lacking in. Now, iron deficiency, the young leaves will have intervenal chlorosis, and what we list here is a sharp distinction between the veins and the chlorotic areas. Essentially, what we're saying there is you'll have intervenal chlorosis, and the veins themselves will stay dark green. Now, that's a really good sign that you've got a, an iron deficiency. Manganese, once again, the young leaves are affected. It's important in enzyme activity and uh, pigmentation. What you're going to find with a lot of these micronutrients are they are a very important in enzyme activity, which is why they are used in such small amounts. Uh, copper, again, enzyme activity. Now, this is one that the, the way the symptoms show up in the plant is you'll have uh, curling of the leaves, and, and even sometimes the leaf tips will wither and die. And this can be caused by a copper deficiency in the soil. But if you look at this, not thinking really what is going on and start to jump to conclusions, you could say, well, my plant's too dry. The leaves are curling. I need to water it more. And the more you water, it's not going to get any more copper, and you may lead to worse problems because now your plant roots start to drown, and other diseases and fungi can come in and cause problems. So uh, this is one of those that doesn't happen often, but you want to be aware that it could be a problem. Uh, boron is another one where the terminal bud will die, and usually you'll see uh, right around the base of that bud, it gets really light green, and then gets really brittle and dies. And this also shows up in the young leaves as chlorosis. And so boron, again, is important in enzyme activity. Molybdenum, important in enzyme activity. And if you have legumes, molybdenum is very essentially involved in the nitrogen fixation, which is one reason that a lot of legumes are grown, is because of nitrogen fixation. Well, without molybdenum, that's not going to happen. And in your plants, once again, you're going to have light green or chlorosis starting to show up. But with molybdenum deficiency, you'll start to see dead spots or necrotic spotting on the leaves. This is an, uh, an, a symptom that doesn't show up with most of the nutrient deficiencies. But with molybdenum, you will start to see some necrosis. And chlorophyll uh, or chlorine, that's involved in chlorophyll formation, uh, once again, and enzyme activity. And with chlorine, there will be distinct chlorotic and necrotic lesions showing up. And chlorine, again, this is like molybdenum. It's one of those that you actually have necrosis going on. And there will be a real abrupt boundary between the dead tissue and the live tissue. So you'll have chlorosis and necrosis if you have chlorine deficiency. Zinc, I think this is the final one we're going to talk about. Once again, involved in enzyme activity. And zinc's one where it's really odd because a lot of times it's the middle leaves, not the older leaves or the younger leaves, but you'll see the symptoms showing up in the middle leaves first. And you'll have the intervenal chlorosis, uh, your plants will be stunted, and it shows up in the middle leaves, and then it starts to show up in later stages in the older leaves or the younger leaves. And so zinc, if you think you have a zinc deficiency, it's going to first show up in those middle leaves. Once again, you're going to have the chlorosis. So that's some of the nutrient deficiencies and the symptoms you can see in your plant. And there's going to be some extra material available for you if you want to go any further, read more about how those nutrients are involved in the plant, some more about the deficiencies. So uh, we hope you guys are all checking out this additional material we're providing for you, because if you have further questions or just want to learn more and become nerds like us, you can check out this extra material, and there's a lot of information that we're giving you there uh, and that we don't spend this 30 minutes to an hour telling you. So keep in mind that that material is available. Now, coming back to fertilizers, we have organic fertilizers and chemical fertilizers. So there's some pros and cons for both of those, and we're going to go over it and hopefully give you enough information that you can uh, start to make some decisions for yourself about which one you want to use, or even maybe if you need to use a combination. But the advantages of organic fertilizers is that they do provide the nutrients your plant needs as it breaks down. 
It has to be broken down into those ionic forms for your plant to take it up. So that doesn't change. But they also improve the structure of the soil. And remember how we told you or what organic material will do in your soil when we're talking about the soil section? The organic matter in the soil increases its water holding capacity and organic matter is an important component in your CEC or cation exchange capacity. So having using organic fertilizers, you're adding organic matter to your soil and you're increasing water holding capacity and its ability to hold on to those nutrients because you're increasing its CEC or cation exchange capacity. So those are, are a couple of big advantages to organic fertilizers. And by using organic fertilizers, we told you, you know, that they have to be broken down by microorganisms before the nutrients are released into the soil. So if you're using organic fertilizers, you're giving food to those microorganisms. And so essentially, you're going to increase the diversity and population of the beneficial microbiota in the soil. So you're making the soil even more alive by giving it organic fertilizers. So that's one of the really big benefits of organic fertilizers is that they're feeding and keeping alive that soil microbiota, which is so, so important to having really good, healthy plants. Now, organic fertilizers, again, are slow-release fertilizers because when you put them in the soil, they aren't in the form that the plant wants. So the microorganisms have to break it down. Now, this takes some time, depending on the environment that uh, the microorganisms are living in, which is you know, the temperature, the moisture, uh, the aeration, all those soil qualities that we were talking about, those have an effect on your soil microbiota and how quickly they will break down organic matter. But organic fertilizers are slow release fertilizers, so they will slowly make nutrients available to your plants, which is a good thing because then you have a slow release fertilizer. You're giving it nitrogen, in the form of an organic matter that can feed your plant for three months or longer because it's slowly released as the microorganisms break it down. And with organic fertilizers, there's usually less chemicals and, and salts or anything like that in there that can build up in the soil. Now, a precautionary statement here is if you're getting composting materials from somewhere else, it's a really good idea to find out what they're using to make that compost and know whether there's materials being added to, if say, if it's composted manures, depending on what's being fed to the animals and other processes that go on before those manures are composted. Compost can have high levels of chemicals and salts in it. So that's just a precautionary statement on using composted materials. Make sure you know where that compost is coming from. And another advantage of the organic fertilizers are they are renewable, biodegradable, sustainable, and environmentally friendly source of nutrients for your plants. So those are six advantages to organic fertilizers, certainly not all of them, but those are six that we thought were important. Now, on the other side, there are some advantages to chemical fertilizers. Uh, one of the biggest advantages to chemical fertilizers are that the nutrients are available immediately to your plant. So if you see plants that are suffering from nitrogen deficiency and you decide you're going to use an organic nitrogen source such as blood meal and you add that to the soil, it's going to be weeks before you start to see any results from your plant. Why? Go back and think about it because that nitrogen isn't available right away. It's in an organic form that has to be broken down by the microorganisms to make those nitrates which are available for the plant to take up. Chemical fertilizers, on the other hand, are formulated to be immediately available. So the nitrogen, as an example, comes in the form of nitrates. They're readily available for the plant to take them up. So if your plant's showing a nutrient deficiency and you use chemical fertilizers, you can see results overnight almost. Within days, your plant will start to recover from that nutrient deficiency. So that's one of the advantages of chemical fertilizers. Another advantage is, remember those big numbers, the N, the P, the K, and then all that guaranteed analysis we were talking to you about? Well, because nutrient or chemical fertilizers are highly processed, 
and highly analyzed, those numbers on chemical fertilizers are usually much, much, much more accurate than the ones on organic fertilizer sources. And that's just because of the processing they go through. So you can count that an advantage if you want. We put that on a list of advantages because you do know exactly what you're getting with the chemical fertilizer. And with chemical fertilizers, there's standardized labeling that's required on all these. So that makes the ratios and chemical sources and all that easy to understand because there's regulations that determine how they're labeled and what goes on, all those sorts of things. So that's another advantage. And one of the final advantages to chemical fertilizers is overall they're usually less expensive than organic fertilizers. Even though organic fertilizers are less processed, they still are from a source naturally occurring. So there can be a lot more involved with getting those and putting them together and some of the precautions that have to be taken with them to prevent the introduction of pathogenic organisms into those organic fertilizers. So uh, there's reasons that they're more expensive, but uh, that's the advantage of the chemical fertilizers. They're usually less expensive than organic fertilizers. Now let's go back and on the other side, look at some of the disadvantage of the advantages of the two. One of the disadvantages of the organic fertilizers and it can be considered a disadvantage. Uh, we're listing it as that because with organic fertilizers, remember, microorganisms have to break down that material in order to make the nutrients available to the plant. And because it requires the activity of microorganisms to make it available, well then, when it's available and how much is available can be greatly affected by the environment by, because those microorganisms, they need, you know, almost all of them need warmth. So they need the right temperature, they need the right amount of moisture, they need the right amount of aeration in order to do their job of converting the organic fertilizers into the form the plant can take up. And because of that, the effectiveness of your organic fertilizer can be seasonally influenced. So an organic fertilizer that you use on your warm season crops, the ones you start in the spring and grow through the summer or the warmer parts of the year, those can be much more effective than if you're using that same organic fertilizer during the cool season, whenever you're growing your cool season crops. Simple reason is when is the environment most conducive for the microorganisms to break down that organic fertilizer and make the nutrients available to your plant. Usually in the warmer parts of the year, it breaks down faster than in the cooler parts of the year. And so that's another disadvantage to the organic fertilizers. Um, if you use a certain amount for tomatoes, that same amount not be, may not be sufficient for your lettuces. So. Take that into account whenever you're calculating how much you're going to use. And with organic fertilizers, a lot of times those actual nutrient ratios aren't really known for sure. And usually the ratios and numbers given are based on tests done over a broad range of different samples. <clears throat> but just taking uh, chicken manure, if you're using that as an organic fertilizer, well, the amount of nitrogen in the chicken manure can actually vary depending on what the chickens are eating and, and even, maybe even sometimes the stresses the chickens are going through. So even though there's a commonly accepted maybe amount of nitrogen that you'll get from chicken manure, it's not as accurate as in the chemical fertilizers. And so uh, that could be a disadvantage. And with most organic fertilizers, the overall percentage of the nutrients within the material itself is much less than in chemical fertilizers, simply a result of them not being processed. So there's a lot of other material in there, good material as far as the soil 
Now, structure and the microorganisms are concerned, but if you're just looking at the plant nutrients that you're making available, they are usually a much lower percentage than the chemical fertilizers. And as mentioned earlier, they're often more expensive than chemical fertilizers. But now chemical fertilizers, they also have their disadvantages. Uh, they're primarily made from non-renewable -renew resources, and that can include the fossil fuels. Uh, that's where a lot of the, these chemicals that go into chemical fertilizers come from, from these non-renewable resources. Plus, the fact that they're going through chemical processing, that uses a lot of energy, which is also uh, usually the fossil fuels. With chemical fertilizers, they do provide the nutrients to your plant, but those provided new plant nutrients don't do anything to sustain the soil. With chemical fertilizers, all you're really trying to do is provide an essential plant nutrient to your plant. You aren't, those aren't being used, taking into consideration anything about whether they would provide anything for the soil microbiota. And I can tell you that most chemical fertilizers do not provide anything for the soil microbiota. So in that sense, chemical fertilizers, all they're doing is feeding your plant, but they're not feeding your soil. And as mentioned earlier, when I was talking about the guaranteed analysis, that smaller portion of the fertilizer label, most, uh, if not many, of the chemical fertilizers do not provide those micronutrients or trace elements. Because they're chemically formulated, they know what goes in them, and unless they decide to add those micronutrients to the chemical fertilizer as they're processing it, they're not going to be in there. Whereas with organic fertilizers, even though they may not list all of those on the analysis part of the label, depending on the organic source, most all organic fertilizers do have some, if not all, of those micronutrients in them. Because why? They're coming from an organic source that itself has already incorporated many of those micronutrients into its cell structure, into its proteins, or into other parts of that organic matter that you're putting into the soil. So most organic fertilizers do provide micronutrients as well. Once again, they're going to be in a slow release form though. Microorganisms have to break down those complex chemicals in order to make the nutrients available to the plant. One of the advantages to chemical fertilizers that I stated was that the nutrients are available immediately to the plant. Well, the flip side of that is it can also be a disadvantage. Because all those nutrients are in ionic form immediately when you use a chemical fertilizer, you can actually over fertilize your plants. And that is not uncommon. You add way too much of a chemical fertilizer and suddenly your plant looks like it's scorched and or in a drought even though you have plenty of water and it's because you've added too much fertilizer it's the high acidity factor of those chemical fertilizers they actually burn the plants roots and so all those root hairs and all those tiny parts of the root that are responsible for taking up the nutrients and the water and everything else that the plant needs, those are damaged or killed by the excess fertilizer, chemical fertilizer that you've added, and you can really injure your plants badly if you over fertilize with chemical fertilizers. Once again, chemical fertilizers are available immediately to your plant. That means they're in an ionic form that the plant can take up. And when they're in those ionic forms, that also makes them more water soluble. And if they're more water soluble, that means they can be leached from the soil faster. So you can add nitrogen in the form of nitrate to your garden that should be sufficient for your plant's needs for the entire growing season. But if you do that, first thing you're probably gonna do is burn your plants because you added all that nitrogen at once that was in the ionic form. The second thing is, after you've irrigated or it's rained a few times, a lot of that nitrogen has left the soil. 
and is no longer available to the plant. So that's one of the big disadvantages of the chemical fertilizers is nutrients are available immediately, nutrients can be leached from the soil. And another disadvantage to the chemical fertilizers is that long-term use of chemical fertilizers uh, it can change the total pH of your soil. So uh, most cases they're lowering the pH. Um, so over the course of time, if all you use is chemical fertilizers, especially if you use chemical fertilizers and never add any organic matter, essentially you're going to come up with a soil that is bereft of microorganisms. The beneficials have left the, left the stadium. They're no longer there. Uh, the chemical fertilizers aren't doing anything to feed those microorganisms, so they die or the ones that are mobile will move on to where they can actually be fed. So long-term use of just chemical fertilizers can uh, almost create a sterile environment. Now, with the organic fertilizers, we talked about the MPK on chemical fertilizers and the analysis and what all that means. Well, organic fertilizers also have those types of labels. Now, anything that is sold and packaged as a fertilizer must have an analysis on it that includes those three numbers, the N, the P, and the K. Now, you'll find a lot of soil amendments that are sold as organic amendments. They can sell composted cow manure. They can sell compost in general. You can even sell um, vermicomposting or worm castings. Those can all be sold as soil amendments and they don't have to have the big analysis done. But if they're sold and packaged as a fertilizer, they have to be analyzed. Well, there has been some analysis done and this table that you see here now, that lists some of the organic fertilizers and their NPK values. We also put on there uh, how quickly the nutrients that are in those organic fertilizers are available to the plant. And it goes anywhere from slow, uh, uh, very slow, medium, rapid. Uh, there are very few that the nutrients are available in rapidly to the plants. There are a couple. But if you see, if you look at these, even some that are uh, a chemical, uh, naturally processed, naturally occurring mineral like rock phosphate, well, that one provides a lot of phosphorus, anywhere from 20 to 32%, depending on where it comes from and how much of uh, non-rock phosphate material is in there, so how much extraneous material is contaminating the, the material that's sold, anywhere from 20 to 32 percent phosphorus. No nitrogen, no potassium, but you'll look, it's very slowly available. So this would be a real slow-release form of phosphate to your plants. And, but you look at the rest of them, as far as the MPK, they're not very concentrated. There's not a high level, usually, of the nutrients available. Now, there are some exceptions, as you'll see there with blood meal. With blood meal, you're getting 12% nitrogen. With fish meal, you're getting 14% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus. But now, the percentages. This is a real important point to understand about the difference between organic fertilizers and chemical fertilizers. You've got those NPK numbers, but with a chemical fertilizer, if it says 10% nitrogen and you've got a 50 pound bag, that means that as soon as you use that fertilizer, 5%, I mean 5 pounds, 10% of that 50 pound bag, 5 pounds of nitrogen is immediately available for your plants to take up. That's what the 10% or that first number on chemical fertilizers tells you. On the other hand, organic fertilizers. Take blood meal, for instance. 12% nitrogen, but that 12% nitrogen is not immediately available to your plant. Of that 12% nitrogen, roughly 3% of that 12% is available to the plant immediately. So if you're adding blood meal with 12%, let's say blood meal is 10% nitrogen, and you've got a 50 pound bag of blood meal, 
10% of that blood meal is nitrogen. So you got roughly five pounds of nitrogen in that 50 pound bag of blood meal. However, with a chemical fertilizer, you got five pounds of nitrogen immediately available to your plant. With blood meal, if you got five pounds of nitrogen in there, only 3% of that nitrogen is available to your plant immediately. So instead of having five pounds of nitrogen available, it has 0.15 pounds of nitrogen immediately available. Over the course of time, all of that nitrogen will become available as the microorganisms break it down, but not immediately. So one thing with organic fertilizers is you'll use a lot more of those to provide your plants with what they need because of when those nutrients are available. Now over the course of time, you may not use a whole lot more than in, you would if you use chemical fertilizers but because you have to constantly add more of the chemical fertilizer on a regular basis to provide that nitrogen that the plant is constantly needing. But you're gonna to have to use a lot more organic fertilizers right off the bat or your plants are gonna start suffering a nutrient deficiency right away because with blood meal, there's 12% nitrogen, but it's not all available immediately. So keep that in mind when you're using organic fertilizers. Those NPK numbers are important. Most have a very low NPK amount with them. That in itself means you're gonna to have to use a lot of organic fertilizers to feed your plants. Plus, even if they have a high number, it's not immediately available. Just point out a couple of quick things here for you. Um, worm castings. That is a really good organic matter to add to your soil. But if you look at the NPK, uh, worm castings on average, it's 1.5% nitrogen, 2.5% phosphorus, 1.3% potassium. So the big NPKs, there's not a lot of it in worm castings. So if this was your sole source of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium for your plants, you're gonna have to use a lot of it. Something that's commonly used, and we've seen it in our work a lot, people using compost teas. And when they use compost teas, they think they're fertilizing their plants. You're not fertilizing your plants. You're doing stuff that's good for your plants. There's other things in compost tea just besides just the plant nutrients. But take a look at this table. Compost tea on average has 0.07% nitrogen, 0.02% phosphorus, and 0.05% potassium. And you think, wow, why is compost tea so low in nutrients? I mean, I'm starting with compost, and even compost has more than that. Or if I start with, you know, composting manures that are really high on the scale, why is my compost tea so low in these nutrients? Okay, go back and think. What did I tell you? One of the disadvantages of organic fertilizers is the nutrients aren't immediately available to the plant. For nutrients to be immediately available to the plant, they have to be in the ionic form that the plant can take them up. If they're in that ionic form that the plant can take them up, they become water soluble. So when you make compost teas, all you're extracting from the compost is the water soluble portion of those nutrients the portion that's immediately available to the plants if you were just using the compost itself. And so now that you understand what those numbers mean and how little of it is immediately available to the plant and organic fertilizers, now you can see why compost teas are really gonna be low, low, low in the NPK because all you're extracting with your compost teas is the readily available nutrients. Now, if you go through some processing, uh, there's some other things that people do when they're making compost teas that can bump these numbers up some. Uh, you can actually make compost teas where you're creating a, a kind of a slurry or soup and let those microorganisms work for a while and start to release more of those nutrients from the organic material that's in there. But by and large, you're never gonna get compost tea that has any appreciable amounts of micronutrients in it. So, uh, or of nutrients in it that's available. So keep that in mind. Compost teas, uh, they're not bad. They can actually improve the quality of the soil, 
but they're not a good source of nutrition. And speaking of composting, uh, that is a really huge subject. Um, we're going to have another class, uh, another course on composting later on, so I hope all you students who are interested in that will keep an eye out for that. Um, when that becomes available, sign up for it and take that. But just, uh, if you're thinking of composting, there are some things that are really important to understand. Uh, there's things that are commonly termed browns, and things that are commonly termed greens. And there's a ratio that you try to keep between the browns and the greens that makes your compost work. Compost is just microorganisms breaking down organic matter. That's all composting is. And so what you're trying to do is to keep that balance between browns and greens uh, at the proper ratio so that the microorganisms can break it down. Think about um, what you're doing when you're making compost is you're actually farming microorganisms. You created a, a little farm, which is your compost pile, and what you're growing in there is microorganisms. And if you're growing microorganisms, you want to give them a healthy diet. And that healthy diet includes everything that they need to survive. And so in the compost you give them, you're giving them their food. And so it's important to know what they like. And through a lot of research and a lot of studies, we understand more about what those microorganisms need to function properly. And some things that uh, go, which you would want to put into your backyard composting, here's the little table showing you all of that. And so these are all things that you can use in your backyard compost. Now, if it's not on this list, it's probably not a good idea to put it into your backyard compost. As you'll notice, there's no meats or oils or fats or anything like that that are being included in what you would go into your compost. That's because these are detrimental to composting in general. And like I said, we'll get into that in a lot more detail in the composting course uh, that we're developing for you. So keep an uh, eye out for that. Uh, so I hope you've learned something about fertilizers, uh, the difference between organics and chemical fertilizers, and now you can make a more uh, informed and knowledgeable source about which ones you want to use. And in some cases, even though you want to try as best you can to use only organic nutrient sources, if you have a really nice plant that is suffering from a nutrient deficiency, think back. Your organic sources are not going to give it what it needs very fast, and it's going to take a long time to recover. So in some cases, it might be like, hey, you know, you give them a little bit of medicine, give them a little bit of that chemical fertilizer to get them back into a normal state, and then your chemical, your organic fertilizer can continue to provide the nutrients it needs. So we look forward to seeing you again soon. Remember, give us some information on those. Uh, that Facebook group, we really love uh, meeting you through there and seeing what you're doing, and we hope you're, that you're getting a lot out of this.